And hello, you are so welcome to the Reluctant Speakers Club Expert Series. And today we're going to talk about what every speaker should know about the power of LinkedIn. And we have an awesome person over in our guest chair, all the way over in Colorado. Hello, Vivica Van Rosen. Hello, how are you today? I am awesome. And just awesome. for people who don't know who Vivica is, Vivica, of course, you are the CEO of LinkedIn into business you Correct. are the author of linkedin marketing an hour a day yep. you are the host of linkedin chat and you're also yep. known as the linkedin expert and i love your story about how you got that name i i literally just got the name and then yeah spent the past 10 years proving it's true but <laughs> yeah, well that's, that's fantastic you yeah. know that's <laughs> opportunity meets luck right <laughs> Exactly that, yeah. Now, Vivica, of course, um, you have a mere 30,000, I guess, uh, connections on LinkedIn, yeah. so you're the perfect person to have a chat with when it comes to how speakers can really make more of this device. And I guess, you know, for speakers, you know, in the same vein that networking is all about the follow-up, the yeah. same thing yeah. is true of speaking which is you can yes. get people excited, you can win their attention, you can inspire people, but if there's radio silence after you leave the stage, <laughs> well, sometimes maybe things go a bit fallow. Yeah, absolutely true. And, you know, it, it's I have 30,000 connections because I've been on LinkedIn for a long time and I made the mistake of just accepting everyone when we first started out. Um, now I'm, I'm, I'm pickier. But thankfully, LinkedIn has something called tags, which is similar to Google circles, you know, G plus circles or LinkedIn, or I'm sorry, Facebook lists or Twitter lists, which allows you to segment your audience. So yes, you can keep in, you can keep in touch with them after the event, because that's where all the business goes, right? It, it goes right through the cracks if you don't follow up, um, which I, is, absolutely. right? <laughs> yeah. you, you know it, yeah. Yeah. But you know, if you think about speakers who are following up and why and how it is that LinkedIn can really help folks to do a better job in their outreach and continuing conversation. Yeah. Why is this tool, and I know there are so many other tools that people yeah. can think about, why is this especially valuable to speakers? Well, I think because it does give you the person's bio um, much deeper than just say a Facebook, you know, 300 character bio or however many it is or a, a Twitter 160 bio. You actually get the person's bio. You can see their communications and their updating and you actually have um, a communications forum via messaging that goes through both both your email and the LinkedIn platform. So you've got a better chance of someone actually seeing that. Um, and then, of course, you've got updates similar to what you have on Facebook and Twitter or G plus as well but it allows you um, different avenues of communication so you can very easily stay top of mind with updates like you would on Twitter or Facebook but you can actually create very targeted messaging campaigns similar I, yeah. again I so think I wish I wish everyone had circles, right? I wish you, when you connected to someone on LinkedIn, like you had to segment and put them into a tagged listing. Um, if you got into the habit of it, and it's so easy on G plus. I mean, I'm, I'm, I wish LinkedIn would would implement that because yeah, once you have. Cool. Right. So you go to an event, you create a tag, you know, social media marketing world, you create a tag that's SMMW as you connect with people and LinkedIn has a really, really good um, now mobile phone as you connect with or mobile uh, app as you connect with them, you know, you you tag them and now you're ready to go. So now you can keep communicating with them on a, on a regular basis and stay top of mind with them. So they don't just hear about you once a year when you go and speak at that no. event. You know what I mean? No, no, absolutely. And actually, I think this is one of the issues in general for folks because, of yes. course, there's no point in being somewhere if nobody can see you. Right, exactly. It's like D David Ogilvy used to say of advertising yeah. that you have the best product in the world and if nobody knows about it, a yeah. remarkable thing will happen. Right, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. So yeah. On, on, that, on that vein, actually, Vivica, it'd be interesting to kind of chat about 
the first job, I suppose, for most people, if you're on a network, is to be found. And yes. so do you have any particular ideas or thoughts or advice you'd give a speaker about being found in the first place? Smart, smart sure. things to do. Sure. Um, so LinkedIn works just like Google, although it's easier in that the more keywords you have in your profile, the more likely you are to get found. Um, I want to, I, I, someone is telling speakers to put their um, their area of expertise or their keywords in the title, in their name, their last name field, totally goes against LinkedIn's end user agreement. Um, and I know this because I did it and I was actually, and still am um, blacklisted on LinkedIn. So you actually can't find me oh. under my keywords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because someone said, you know, and it's true, if you put your keywords after your name, your last name, so it was Vivica Von Rosen, colon space, LinkedIn expert and speaker, it showed up in Google really well, but <laughs> it, well, it, I, better, I better check mine too. Because yeah, get rid of anything after. <laughs> <laughs> now, that being said, you, you have a lot of opportunity to plug your keywords into LinkedIn, whether it's your professional headline, which is the area right underneath your name that people see most of the time anyway. So go ahead and make it readable, but you can absolutely put your keyword in there. You have uh, lots of area to put keywords in your summary section. In fact, if you've got a premium account, um, LinkedIn gives you a, a keyword tool. So as you're writing your summary section, as you're copying and pasting your summary section, which is, is 2,000 characters that talk, talks about who you are, what you do, but more importantly, yeah. who you serve and how you help them, what's in it for them. Um, but LinkedIn is a keyword tool says, oh, have you thought about, you know, social media marketing? Have you thought about speaking, you know, keynote speaking? Have you, and it'll actually feed you keywords that you can write in and then put those keywords in other areas of your LinkedIn profile, like your experience section. You have publications. So those of you who are speakers who also have books, you know, by all means, put your book in the publications area. Yeah, I've done um, that interests right yeah yeah interest section is right at the bottom of your profile or that's where it shows up and you can just put a keyword dump there i mean that's the only place i'll say that you can dump all your keywords but you know absolutely keyword comma space keyword comma space keyword comma space down at the bottom in your interest section essentially as long as you've got more keywords than your com competitor you're going to show up before they do but well, that's a good, good plan yeah <laughs> But don't forget your LinkedIn, your, your profile also has to be compelling because if you, it's just like having a really sucky website, you know, someone does a, a search for you on Google and they find your website, but it's not engaging and there's nothing there that people want to click on, you've lost that traffic. So it's the same thing on, on LinkedIn. You want to make sure that once they find your profile, make it engaging, make it interesting, be speaking to your audience, you know, have yeah. media there's there's a lot of different ways to make your profile interesting yeah well and actually on that front in terms of making things interesting actually i i will tell you that i just today loaded a video but no so i was very excited about that yes it doesn't take much to get me excited really <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But, yeah, I mean, I, you can add media. So like one of the things with, with my speakers, I, I tell them, you know, put your experience section, your your, your company name, whatever it is. But you can also do a, a separate section as a keynote speaker. And then you can add your speakers reel. You can upload your one sheet. You can add it. I have a, a video introduction of me at a huge event. I mean, the screen was just very impressive and it was very techy. And the guy who was, who was, well, like you, you know, the guy who was doing the introduction, very good looking and with a sexy accent. Oh, so I put that you. in there too. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can use media. You could take a chapter of your book and upload a chapter of your book with a, lots of click here to download the book links in it. You can put a link to your book if you've got a book on, you know, Amazon or wherever you're selling it. So lots of opportunities as a speaker to start pulling in that media, which not only makes your profile more interesting, but drives traffic, which, you know, is kind of the yeah, point. Absolutely. Lots of people. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, so so before I get into the whole area of uh, sharing content, and I will tell you that LinkedIn is my number one tool for sharing blogs. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and absolutely number one also for the for the, the the period of time that people will spend listening to, reading, and doing lots of different things. But yeah, in terms of what speakers can do to follow on from things that they have done 
from the podium. So you've got the people excited, you've got a great message, people are really interested to know more about you, to stay in touch, you've shared your cards. Now, yeah. staying in touch, that's pretty important. Yeah. What, what are your best tips on that? You know, and that's again, we're going back to what we were talking about earlier. That's where tagging is really important. So, um, like I always have, and because I speak and train and talk about and write about LinkedIn, it's a little, it's a little bit of a no-brainer for me. But I always have my LinkedIn contact information, my URL, and and the Gmail address to to invite me um, to on on my slides. So the first thing is invite people to connect with you on LinkedIn, and you know maybe even tell them how to do it really quickly, or just leave it at you know leave it up to them to connect with you, and then um, hopefully they'll know to personalize the invitation. But even if they don't, you might have a, a roster of the people who are at the event and then you know immediately tag them uh, tag them with the tag them with the event name um, if you can is probably the best way of doing it and then now you can send uh, once you've got your your network tagged now you can send up to 50 people at a time a little message like you know can you believe that that event was a week ago um, how time flies it just seems like yesterday or can you know um I, I loved this article that i read about that event how you know did did you like it or did you enjoy the event or what was your favorite oh. part right and so you just keep this rolling conversation going nothing salesy or pitchy yeah. but you're staying top of mind and once a week and then maybe it peters down to once a month and then maybe you dial it back up to you know, once a week, the the month before the next year's event, you know, hope to see you there. Hey, I have this special promo code if you haven't signed up yet. You know, so it drives all kinds of business towards the event itself. And let me tell you, if you're driving, if you're driving people to a person's event, they will hire you again next year. Right? Yeah, and I, so. I, and I liked Vivica what you said, and I think it's really so important about not using the generic um, yeah. uh, I'd like to connect with you on LinkedIn, which is the equivalent to saying I ha I can't be bothered. Right, and, I couldn't um, be bothered to read your profile. So, your profile, um, <laughs> yeah. and so I'll have my people speak with your people if yeah. only I with the work. <laughs> exactly. Now, you know, you have to understand, it's not their fault, really. A lot of people don't know you can customize an invitation. A lot of people upload a mailing list and, and it just LinkedIn sends out a blanket invitation. Invitation. I've noticed on some of my clients um, who are newer to LinkedIn, when they hit the connect button, it just sends the invitation automatically. They don't have to say how they know the person. But yeah, if you go to a person's profile, hopefully when you hit the connect button, you have the opportunity of saying how you know them and then writing a little personal note where we met how we know each other sure and have you uh, over the end number of years and gazillion people you've connected with have you come yeah. up with um or have you found that there are certain um types of communication tips or manners that really matter to you yeah, you know, um, even though I, in, in, actu in, in, in actuality, it is my assistant who does a lot of this for me, but um, if, if you can make it sound like it's you, um, yeah. if you, right, if you can um, keep it very peer to peer. You know, you don't want to be groveling, but you also don't want to be too casual, um, especially if you have someone doing this for you. So, the, the you know, the more peer-to-peer -peer that you can make it, if you can kind of identify, like when I'm doing this for my clients, we'll identify a target market and then... Um, will we'll create, it's only 300 characters, so it's not like you can go crazy yeah. here, but yeah. we'll say something like, as a leader or as a professional or as a thought leader in this community, um, I see we're both on LinkedIn, but we're not yet connected. Was wondering if you would would be interested in that, or was wondering if you would accept an invitation. Or I've heard people say, "Hey, let's rectify that by connecting right now." That's a little bit pushy for me, but I thought, yeah, "Oh, that's no, pretty I, clever." Yeah, yeah. And, right? Yeah. So it's it 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 has to do do with your industry. It has to do with your location. I mean, let's face it: the British are a little bit more reserved than us crazy Americans. <laughs> they um, are. And the, right? the Irish, we, we we don't know. Uh, uh, the, we're, we're in between the two. Right. 
<laughs> right, exactly. So you're not as reserved, but maybe not as in your face. As, and then sex, you know, men and women communicate differently. So you want to make sure that when you're writing, and it's, only, like I said, it's only 300 characters, test it out, you know, do some split testing, run one, run one invitation and see how many responses you get, and then run another invitation and see how many responses you get, and then choose the one that gets you the best best response. Well, I, th I think that's good advice. And, you know, yeah. the, we have to realize, of course, that it is a business space, but, you yeah. know, you're building relationships. And so you need to have, exactly. you know, you don't want your conversation to be up in the air in right. the way that it's, you know, it's either too clumsy or folksy, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, you don't want to be a stiff either. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, if it's a friend of mine, I'll be like, yo, dude, how, how are we not even connected yet? Like, how is that even possible? Um, but yeah, usually when I'm reaching out to to my target market, you know, we're we're talking executives of of you know enterprise or exe you know Fortune 500 company. So it, th there's not going to be any yo dudes in that. No. <laughs> Maybe the <laughs> well, guy from GoPro. I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you'll have to have something on your head then. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Now, speaking of um, of things that are in the head or more cerebral, um, the, the whole notion of sharing content, of course, yes. LinkedIn is an awesome tool um, for, for doing that. Yeah, yeah. Again, when it comes to uh, content that um, if you find business audiences tend to really get excited about, yeah, yeah. what are your observations about that? You know, it's interesting when, when LinkedIn came out. So LinkedIn has this thing called Publisher, which hopefully you all know about. It's the ability to share long form posts or things that essentially look like blog posts as opposed to, as opposed to just the smattering of updates, right? Those yeah. things that look like tweets. So the long form posts or Publisher, what's great about it is you can absolutely repurpose content you already have. So it's not like you have to create fresh content for your, for your website and then for LinkedIn and then for, you know, a guest post somewhere. You can absolutely repurpose content that you've already created as long as it's relevant to your LinkedIn audience. Um, but I love it because LinkedIn posts are sticky. And what I mean by that is two things actually. First of all, they live forever on your profile underneath your picture in your headline. They yeah, just sit been. down there, right? So they're always there. And, and it, the top three I think it's three, yes, will show. And then you can click, of course, on the see more button and all your posts will be there with their nice pictures and their titles and people can click on them, look at them, read them and share them at any point. Um, they tend to get, so my, I, I get about, I don't know, 20 to 30,000 unique views on my website every month. Great, 20 to 30,000 people, woohoo. Um, LinkedIn has 350 plus million people who could potentially see your post. So sure. you've got, right? So unless you're IBM or HubSpot or social media marketing world where you have 100,000 people on your site every day, um, LinkedIn gives you a much grander audience. And what's cool as well is, yes, it'll go on to the update stream automatically of all the people that you're connected to, but then they have the opportunity of, of liking it and sharing it. So you've got that amplification um, process going on. And then it's also sticky because LinkedIn posts and uh, uh, SlideShare are the only two pieces of content other than your profile itself that are actually searchable by keyword. So if someone's looking for well, a blogging... Cool. Right. Yeah. So if someone's looking for a LinkedIn expert or a blogging expert or a process development expert or whatever area of expertise that you speak about, um, what shows up in that search is going to be people with those keywords in their in their profile. So profiles are going to show up company pages with those keywords in it content blog posts or published posts with those keywords in it and SlideShare. SlideShare um, uh, presentations with those keywords in them. And so people, if they're wanting to read something, if they're wanting to get information as opposed to just wanting to connect to someone, they're a lot more likely to click on that post and read it. So now your, amp, your, you know, your post again is amplified. And if you've got kind of a weird niche market, like I'm a LinkedIn expert writing about LinkedIn on LinkedIn. So there's a gazillion of us. But if you've got a really niche market that not a lot of people are talking about, you absolutely have the opportunity of positioning yourself as a thought leader. I uh, One of my clients does custom flags. And 
we we just literally looked up custom flags. No one had even written about custom flags yet on LinkedIn. Another one of my clients, right? Exactly. Another one of my clients um, does uh, uh, industrial tape. So we're like, okay, industrial tape. And again, no one had actually written about industrial tape on LinkedIn. So now we have, and believe it or not, um, we did uh, 50 shades of duct tape, I think, to kind of align oh. with the, right? I, you know, make it, if it's boring, make it interesting. But she actually yeah. got called and interviewed um, on, on because of that article. So it is great for positioning yourself as a thought leader as well. Uh, and then on top of that, LinkedIn has this thing called Pulse, which is a newsreader app that they bought a few years ago and have now made part of LinkedIn. Pulse has channels of information, women in business, entrepreneurship, big data, et cetera, et cetera, 30 or 40 different channels. If your post gets physically moved into that channel and there are, there are real live people who, you know, when an algorithm pops up and says this is getting a lot of shares, they will look, they will read, and they will physically move that post into Pulse. If it gets moved into Pulse, again, the the amplification, the um, possibility of your post being seen and shared, is exponentially yeah, increased. Immense. Immensely increased. Don't write about LinkedIn, though. That's what we've learned. If you write about LinkedIn forget the shares yeah. but if you you know if you if you write about a specific niche market um, or something that's interesting to people in general and then a lot of the blogging rules apply right have good imagery you can you've got a nice big I, I forget the dimensions right now it's like oh, not you. that's a question yeah uh, is there a difference in terms of the size of image that you ought to use yeah, so now this is relatively new again. The um, I think it's like it's weird. It's like six hundred and twenty-three by four hundred and eighteen or something. But it'll tell you um, when you go to create your post the first time. The 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 initial image is it'll tell you exactly the pixelation. But you want a nice arresting photo there. Now as you write your post and add images in and add video in and that kind of thing, you know you. you make it look good essentially is what you want to do but the the initial image needs to be arresting um put numbers you know lists numbers etc in the title yeah. like five ways to do this or ask a question in the title are you you know are you frustrated by social media um is fresh is is, is social media um constraining your time um do you know do you know how to do an effective podcast so questions or numbers work really well in the title because people go yes yes i do click um Fine, and yes, i do Right. Yes, I do. And then numbers are good because it gives people a false sense of how long I, it's a it's a psychological thing. But if I say five, I know, yeah. if I see right five steps to creating an effective podcast, I think, oh, five steps. Yeah, this isn't going to take me more than, you know, five minutes to read. It might. It might not. It might take five seconds. But nonetheless, that there's that association that there's not this much time that I have to invest. Um, and then this is different, though. I know a lot of you know, a lot of people say keep it short and sweet. You hold people's attention for what is it, 0. 0.8 seconds or something like that. Well, now, no, it, 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 eight seconds is the average <laughs> attention span of, 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 right. of an adult. One more, yeah. one less than a goldfish. Then but, one less than goldfish. Exactly. But online, you don't get eight seconds. You get two seconds first off, and then you yeah. get two seconds while people wait for something to load, and yeah. then two seconds whether they can be bothered to read it. Right. <laughs> Exactly. So that first two seconds, you've just got to get them with the image and the title. Once they click on it and it uploads, this is you, you actually on LinkedIn, the longer the post, the more in depth the post, because this is business reading. This isn't the funnies, right? This is, uh oh, sorry about that. Ah, go away. Um, this is, <laughs> someone decided to <laughs> call me. A, we have a critter. We had a, we uh, we had a we had a someone saw I was online and decided now would be the perfect time to call in. Um, right. you, the the longer and the more involved uh, a post you, that you can create, the better. Basically, yeah. so um, my friend John uploaded. I kid you not, his master's. He's a marketing major, but his master's thesis. Um, so pages and pages long. The thing got like six hundred thousand views. 
Holy smokes. <laughs> yeah, I know. He got like job offers and consulting offers. And I think he grew his network by like 10,000 people because of one post. Now, I've never been able to do that. And honestly, um, other than the fact that I'm now going to be hiring John to do this for my clients, um, I, I haven't been able to ever replicate that. But you never know. And I mean, for him, that was winning the lottery. Um, and you can imagine a master's thesis was really, really well written. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> right. So the deeper, the more in depth, the more keywords you can use, um, and, and the better the post that you know, the the more likely you are to get it found. But absolutely, feel free to repurpose content that um, you've already created for your yeah. for your blog. Yeah. yeah. Are are there limitations or difference in formats and other things that might be different for people who are using blogs? It, a little bit like you can't do colored text. Um, you can do bold. You can do italics. You can add lists. You can add f images. You can add um, YouTube videos. Uh, you cannot. You get like header one, header two. You don't get a lot of play with okay. um, headers, and but you know it's it's kind of like WordPress one hundred and one. You know, think yeah. about WordPress back in two thousand and seven. It's it's kind of like that. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that, so th those are absolutely wonderful ways for speakers to create yeah. content that can continue conversation, get people to pay attention, yes. come back for more and all of those kinds of things. But tell absolutely. me a little bit, though, about the dreadful mistakes, the things that people do, and my goodness, they shouldn't. Yes, yeah, exactly. So we've already talked about one. Do not put anything other than your last name in the last name field. I mean, that that has literally cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars because I'm finally findable under my name. Thank you. If you Google, if you if you Google LinkedIn expert, my LinkedIn profile shows up first, which is awesome. Um, but if you actually do LinkedIn consulting, LinkedIn speaking, speaking LinkedIn expert, LinkedIn books, um, all the all the things I find uh, I show up on under Google, I don't show up on under LinkedIn because I'm still blacklisted for putting something other than my last yeah. name in the last name field, right? So don't yeah. do it. It is not worth it. Um, the other thing not to do, a lot of people will create multiple accounts, like they've hit their 30,000 limit. So they're like, okay, this will be Vivica Von Rosen too. Um, or they'll create, they have different uh, verticals. So they'll create a LinkedIn profile for each vertical, or they'll create a company page as a LinkedIn profile. So, you know, instead of their picture, their logo, instead of their name, their company name, uh, that all of that goes against LinkedIn's end user agreement. You're only allowed to have one personal profile. LinkedIn has company pages similar to Facebook. They're not as autonomous as Facebook company pages, but, you know, they allow you to create a new header to talk a thousand character description and then to post updates as your company. So you can have as many of them as you have unique URLs, but as far as keeping your, you know, your personal profile, only one. Um, LinkedIn will make you choose. It's Sophie's choice, right? I, I, no I know because I've done it. So LinkedIn will make you choose. At some point, someone will turn you in and you're going to have to choose one profile after the other and you're going to lose all those followers or connections and you're going to lose all that activity and you're going to lose all the time you put into it. So don't do that. Um, don't use your LinkedIn updates and your LinkedIn posts just to sell your wares. I've seen too many people, you know, every post, this is nothing against realtors, but they go out there and every post is a listing, a house listing. People aren't going to go to LinkedIn necessarily to buy houses. If you've got a really cool story, how this house is haunted or this, how this house was once owned by this famous person or some of the cool things about the house, you can, you know, write a story about it, but not some listing. Similarly, no. you're not going to put a post up there with your book and say, buy this, right? So uh, the, People misuse, they, they, they become, as, as, as Chris Brogan says, selly, 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 you know, selly, selly, yeah, seller. Well, selly, selly bit, I have to say. The one yeah. thing that I freely admit hugely annoys me, and I will uh, instantly turn somebody off when they do this, is when I connect with somebody and literally 15 minutes later, I get a selly, selly oh. message. Oh, my gosh. That I actually wrote a blog post about it. It drives me insane because I, I said I would connect with you on LinkedIn. I did not say I wanted to be signed up to your newsletter. And and my, my friend, I'm not going to say who it is, another LinkedIn expert, the, he, he actually recommends this as a practice. And no, <laughs> they, no, and it can get you in serious trouble if you work with Canadians. Seri I mean, millions of dollars worth of fines if you do this. So, oh, tell me about right? that. 
ah, like right with the castle laws, Canadian anti-spam laws. So if you connect with someone on LinkedIn, you can send them a message through LinkedIn saying, at, not right away, like buy them a drink first, as it were, you know, <laughs> but, but have some conversation with them, share some interesting information, and then say, hey, by the way, I have this blog. If you're interested, you can sign up here. That's yeah, okay. Uh, but just putting, importing them, oh, oh, yeah, just yeah. importing them into your list, that is a huge no-no. And it can get you, like I said, in serious trouble in Canada and probably in Europe in various areas as well. But it's a red card offense anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's a huge, that is, thank you for bringing it up. That is probably my biggest pet peeve on LinkedIn. Other things oh, yeah. are usually done by accident, but that's, yeah, no. I'll, yeah. I'll immediately unconnect and I might even report them as spammers unless they're, yeah. you know, okay. Look, Vivica, I, this has been an outstanding conversation, <laughs> but before I let you go, I want to yes. ask you, so you're a speaker as well as yep. a trainer and a, a, a writer extensively yep. on like, uh, LinkedIn. And if you think about this now more from a speaking perspective, yeah. what's the one thing that you as a LinkedIn expert have learned most from over the last N number of years, things that you realized, you know, I wish I knew that a long time ago. As far as speaking or as far as LinkedIn? Both. Well, you know, in, in either case, yeah. Um, you know, in my business, um, what I wish I had done way early on, like year one instead of year five, is hire more help to help me out. Uh, someone, I, gosh, I wish I could remember who it was, once said to me, it was like the best piece of advice, only do what only you can do. If someone else can do your accounting, let them. If someone else can do your email follow-up, let them. If someone else can do your LinkedIn follow-up, let them. If someone else can do, you know, your, what else do I, your, your slide presentations, let them. Only do what only you can do because that frees you up to focus on your area of expertise and I know, I mean, the re what kept me back was I can't afford it. I, you know, I can't afford, I, I'm barely well, making 10 bucks an hour myself. I can't afford to hire someone for 10 bucks an hour. But the fact is it makes you look more professional. So now you can, you, now you can, now you can work for $20 an hour. Um, it will more than pay for itself in the long run. And I'm kidding about the $20 an hour. I, you know, obviously yeah. we're 200 to $2,000 an hour, but you, you really do. You can up level your, your presence and you can focus on what you do best, which will naturally increase more business. I mean, it will absolutely naturally increase your business. So, yeah. you know, like on LinkedIn, yeah, Nicole reaches out and invites people to connect. Um, Nicole responds to people who like endorse me. But if someone emails me directly, she'll immediately let me know, like, you have to respond to this message. Someone said this after the endorsement. You know, this person invited you to connect and personalize the message. I'll take care of that myself because that's something only I can do because only I know those people. But, uh, yeah, I'm constantly trying to figure out ways that I can delegate um, all aspects. I mean, anytime I sit down to a task, it's, is this something Nicole can do? Yes, it is. Good. She, we're going to have her do it. Is this something Nicole can do? Crap. No, it isn't. All right, here I go. So, <laughs> you know, it, it really, it's, that is the, I wish I'd listened to the person who had told me that early on. And I, I just can't recommend it. That first question is, can I delegate this to somebody else? I and love you that. You can't do it. Only only do what do you it can only do. you can do only do it only you can do right but do it right? well but do it impeccably yeah 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 wonderful well look thank you so much for joining with me tonight i really have enjoyed it it's been wonderful thank you <laughs> good and, uh, <laughs> in wrapping up can i say um thank you also for watching the reluctant speakers club expert series and until the next time happy speaking